Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. In today's video, I'm going to go over how to build a sheath just like this, which I think is one of the easiest and cheapest ways to make a sheath for your axe. Stick with me, we'll get started. thing you've got to do when you're making a leather sheath is you need to make a pattern. I like to use these uh, whatever they're called manila folders. It's just about the right thickness for a pattern that you can keep and use over and over. Um, I hear cardboard from uh, a case of beer works just as well. So I'm gonna just set this on here kind of randomly. Um, I, I need to make sure I've got enough room for a welt and a flap. So that looks pretty good to me. So the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to trace the outline of my bit. Now that I got the basic outline of the sheath done, I'm uh, drawing in the welt here and this style of sheet doesn't really require welt but we're going to do it anyways because it's stronger. It does help protect the blade of the axe better. I'll typically make my welt about half inch to five eighths of an inch wide. On something like this we're using rivets it probably would have benefited me to go about three quarters of an inch wide. Uh, it just gives you a little bit more room to play with. You don't want the rivets too close to the edge and you don't want them off the welt. Now I'm just drawing in a little bit of style to the sheath and establishing the actual outline of the sheath. And I'm gonna cut it out of this folder here and you can see I'm leaving a lot of material on top to make my flap. And then I just go in here and I freehand this flap and this is where you kind of get artistic with your sheath. Don't just uh, copy what I did here. Just try to try to do your own thing and come up with your own style. You can make this as basic or as fancy as you want. There's no rules. Now in order to make the front of the sheath, all I did was fold that flap over the flat side of that folder and then drew the outline of it. Then I mark on my pattern any notes that are important for that sheath I'm making because I, I might hang on to these patterns to do sheaths in the future. In this case, I, I ended up not keeping any of these, and we'll get to that later on here in the video. Pretty basic here. I'm just going to trace out all my patterns onto my clean leather. I want to try and avoid any defects or blemishes in the leather, but I don't get too carried away. I, I like some of the rustic to shine through in my finished work. But I just trace it out with a pencil. You can use pen, it really doesn't matter. You just don't want to use like a sharpie because it'll bleed into the leather and you might not be able to cover it up later.
So I got everything traced out and I went ahead and broke down my leather into individual pieces. Now I'm doing the final cut. For this project, I used Herman Oak, probably a bit thick. It might be a 10, 12 ounce. So you're gonna want something around an eight, nine ounce or nine, 10 ounce, somewhere along there. Veg tan leather, you could use really any leather you want with the exception of anything chrome tanned. I'm really not gonna go into types of leathers in this video because I'm not really an expert on it. I know what I like. I typically use either a nice veg tan, like you see in this video, it's just a plain blank canvas really. Or I'll use an English bridle, which I prefer. But this leather is some of the toughest leather I've ever had to cut. I really struggled with this. Typically I can get a much cleaner cut and, and I don't have to spend as much time sanding. But it's not a big deal. You just want to get the pieces cut out to the rough shape. We're going to sand them later and get them all dialed in. Obviously, if you have any straight cuts, you're going to want to use a square to make those straight cuts. And it's really the best way. What you see now is I, this is a strap cutter. These can be had pretty cheap. I'm going to leave a link in the description below for all the tools used in this video. Uh, some will be affiliate links, some won't. Uh, it's just going to be the tools that I use and the ones that I prefer. Some of these things you can cheap out on and other ones are going to be a little bit expensive. But once you have these tools, you know, you'll know you have them for life and you can make hundreds of sheaths with them. So they don't really wear out. Blades do wear out. You have to replace blades over time. But some of these tools can be sharpened over and over for a lifetime of use. So... I'm just cutting out 5 8 wide strips of leather and I'm going to use these for my welts. I'll show you this later on. A lot of people, and me included, I used to cut my welts out the shape of the sheath. And I figured out that when you do that, you, you create a lot of waste. And by doing the welts the way I'm going to show you, you actually are using your waste. This piece that I'm cutting in the welts well, wasn't big enough to do anything with and it wasn't good enough to do anything with other than make welts out of. So it would have just gone in the trash. But now I have the welts for my sheaths. So I'll show you guys here in a minute when we get to glue up. All right, now I'm taking a pair of dividers. And, uh, these are just probably machinist dividers or something or scribes, if you want to call them. And I'm marking out where the welt is going to be on the sheath. And I'm also going to mark the back side of the sheath, how high up the welt goes, where the flap will fold over the front. You don't want to take any glue past that top edge of the front of the sheath. So I'm just going to mark these all out. This will come in handy when I get ready to dye the leather. You don't want to dye where you're going to glue because the glue won't stick as well. Now we're gonna take an edger and I believe this is a number three and the front of each sheath, the top edge, we're gonna go ahead and edge those now because you won't be able to burnish that after the sheath is put together. We're basically getting ready to finish the top edge of the front of the sheath. And this is optional. You don't have to round these edges over or burnish anything. This just helps make the end product a much nicer, cleaner finish. Alright guys, this is just water. 
And there's a lot of different ways to finish the edges of leather or burnish the leather. Um, I'm not going to get into all that today, and I'm not going to go over all of those different ways you can do this. I'm just going to show you how I do it 90% of the time. So all I did is put some water on that wool dauber and ran it over across the top edge, and now I'm burnishing it with a wooden burnisher. This is an actual tool for burnishing leather. It's just a wood dowel. And this process here isn't about pressure, it's about friction. So by rubbing that across the leather, you're heating the leather up and it gives it like a glassy, smooth finish. You don't wanna put a lot of pressure on it because you will roll the edges. Now we're going to go ahead and dye our leather. I only use feet, uh, professional pro dyes, uh, oil based, or I don't know what the other kind is, but you never want to use a water based leather dye. It's just going to fade away or uh, bleed through. You don't want your, your leather or your dye to bleed off on anything, especially if you're making anything that's like a belt or suspenders or something like that that's going to touch clothing. So you want to just stick with professional dyes. This happens to be V-brings, I think is how you say it. And I'm just applying this dye with a wool scrap. I guess it'd be a wool sheepskin scrap. Um, I'll see if I can find those too and put those in the description down below. But you could use a the wool dauber is the thing to my right in the screen there. So it looks like a little cotton swab on a stick. You could use that or what I'm using here. I prefer this method because you're able to lay down a much more even coat. And if you watch real closely, you can see I, I continuously rub around the leather. You can see where it starts to soak in the leather. It looks dry. I'll go back over those sections several times. This just helps make the leather dye even. You don't get any blotchy spots in your leather. Also when dyeing leather, a lot of it has to do with the quality of leather and how it takes dye. So your cheaper leathers aren't going to take dye real well, but your more expensive leather will. Don't get too hung up on this guys. The lighter colored dyes are the ones that you have to worry about the most. If you're using black or brown, it's, it's not really gonna matter. This was a safety orange, believe it or not, and it doesn't look anything like what I had in mind. It, to me, it looks more like a red, but uh, it, it, that's the problem with all oil-based dyes or professional dyes. The, the, the dye is always darker than what you expect. Now if you use an English bridal leather, those typically come pre-dyed from the factory. So you're gonna get a, uh, what they call a struck through dye on their English bridles. So the dye is real deep, basically. I prefer those, um, just, skip the dyeing process but you can't always get the color you want and you can mix custom colors uh, some of you have been around long enough you you're familiar with my obsession with green and you'll know that I've created my own custom green leather dye <laughs> uh, basically because I couldn't find a bright enough green one pro tip I'll add is you always want to start with the finished side of your leather when dyeing because if I was to start on the inside of the leather or the flesh side, I believe they call it, 
the unfinished side, this part you're not going to see when the product is finished. If I was to start there and I happen to splash dye on the finished side, it would dry different than when you apply the actual finish and then it'll make a dark spot on your finished side of leather that you'll have a really hard time blending in. So you always want to start on your finished side first. This just helps get you the cleanest end results you can possibly get. This is the inside of the sheath that you're not going to see and you can see I'm not taking the die all the way to the edges. That's where we marked earlier for our welt. Like I said earlier, you don't you want to try to avoid getting dye in the areas that you're going to glue so the glue will stick better. Now we're starting to prep our welt for glue up. What I'm doing here is roughing up the surface on the welt uh, so the glue will stick better. Uh, I'm using a rasp, but you could use sandpaper. I, th I just find the rasp works much quicker. For glue, I'm using some uh, DAP weld, weld wood, contact cement. You could use barge. Either way, they both work fine. I think they work the same. You want to put glue on all of the contacting surfaces and then let it dry. Let it get to like a tacky. You can see I'm touching it here and feeling it. It's a little sticky. And then you just take the welt and you line it up with the outside edge of the sheath and just kind of bend it in place. Then you just, I'm tapping it down here with a hammer to help seat it make it stick a little better. And then again, we're just running it to the edge and tap it in place. Then I'll just trim all the ends. You wanna do the front face of your sheath first as well. That way you can trim the edges. Then we'll just line this up the best we can. We're going to sand this here in a little bit so it doesn't have to be absolutely perfect, but you want to get the edges as close as you can. We'll give it a final tap here. Something else I want to add, if you're going to dye your leather, you should let your leather dye dry for as long as possible. Um, I don't like to, I like to dye the day before and then go back to my project because you don't want it wet at all. So now I'm going to clean up all the edges. I'm going to sand all the edges flush and the sheath is going to start taking its final shape here. Now I'm using a 2x72, but obviously you could do this with anything. You be creative. Use what you got. If, if all you have is sandpaper and a block of wood, that's what will work. You don't have to have these fancy tools to do this. I'm just doing it because I have it, and it makes it quicker. Plus, I'm making four of these all at once. Now we're using an edger to uh, round over the corners of the sheath. I think this is a number three. I'll put a link in the description. But this just gives a nice clean finished look to your leather, rounds over the hard corners and uh, really brings it together. We're really starting to take shape here. Our sheath is really starting to look like something. Nice clean product. This is what they call a stitching groover. 
but I have a tip in it that's called a creaser. And all this is doing is creasing the leather at a set distance from the edge. Now I'm using this as a guide on where I want to put my rivets. So the stud of the rivet will go in the center of that line. But I'm also using it for decoration. It really it gives the leather like a border design and it, it really brings it together. So of course this is optional, you don't have to do this, but it is a nice little touch. So there's a lot of ways you could get your holes in your leather for your rivets. I'm drilling because this leather is so thick. If I were to punch it, the punch wouldn't go all the way through without making a really large hole in the front side. So I'm just using like a 5 30 seconds drill bit, I believe, and I'm drilling the holes. I'm putting a hole in each corner of the sheath, and then I'm trying to work out the spacing here with these indicators to something that makes sense and and will look good you want to try and get these as even as possible because your eye is going to draw right to something that's out of place so if it looks nice and neat and even all the better So we're using copper rivets. So there's two pieces to a copper rivet. You got the rivet and you got a burr. The burr looks like a washer and you see me setting it on top there. And you need a rivet setter. There's a couple different style of tools you can use. This is a better style, I think. It seats the burrs a lot better and it doesn't leave any marks on the leather. Whereas the other style couldn't leave a mark. But essentially, you just go in, you set these burrs. They kind of, they're kind of undersized, so when you hit them with the tool, it kind of forces them onto the studs of the rivet. And then these are just a pair of side cuts or nippers or whatever you want to call them. And I'm cutting the stud probably about a sixteenth of an inch above that burr. You want to leave a little bit protruding. And then this tool is domed, and that's going to round over the stud of the rivet, locking everything together. Guys, these are almost impossible to get apart. All right, guys, so quick interjection into this video. I, at this point, I'm aware of a problem that I overlooked in the very beginning. And I'm, kind of, I'm working my way through this problem. And this kind of stuff happens when you're doing leather work. Um, it's very difficult to foresee every issue that may come up. You just kind of have to do the stuff and make the mistakes and then learn from them and adjust as you go. So the problem is what I didn't take into consideration and um, all these axes are this, uh, have the same problem is how thick this area below the bit is. Uh, typically, a normal axe would have a much thinner section here and this problem wouldn't occur. So when I made the design of these sheaths, I put the end of this, the bottom end of this sheath pretty far back on that bit. The problem is that bit is so much wider than this sheath, it won't allow the actual bit to go down in the sheet. So essentially, 
these sheaths won't fit these axes the way they are right now. So after glue up, I, I typically do a little test fit. That's when I noticed the problem. And my at first my thoughts were, well, I'll just wet four of them. That'll compensate. Well, I don't think the leather's gonna stretch that far. These things are, are pretty hard to get on. So what I'm gonna do is fix the design of these sheets. I'm gonna cut these corners out of the, of the pattern and leave more open at the bottom. Hopefully that will correct what is going on here. So, um, not, I'm probably not gonna show that. It, but uh, it's not gonna make sense when you see the final product and you don't see, you see a different design than what I started with. That's what happened. So cross your fingers. If you see this video, my idea of cutting these corners out <laughs> worked and you'll see the finished product. Now we're gonna start treating the edge of our all our sheets. You guys can see in the video there, I did uh, cut all these to make them fit the heads. But there's a lot of different ways you can finish the edge on these. Um, I'm just doing dye. I'm gonna dye them the color of, of each sheath. So it's pretty straightforward. You just put dye on the edge. <laughs> um, we'll get it. We'll get them all dyed up, and then we'll let them dry, and then. You don't have to let these dry overnight. You actually want the edge to be a little damp when you go to burnish it. So this does help with the burnishing. And then on this, this one's natural. So I'm just using water here on the edge. And then you can see I'm rubbing a uh, piece of canvas across the edge that, that will burnish. All right, so now I'm gonna apply Obanoff's Heavy Duty LP, and I'm going to put a very large amount, more than I normally would, on these sheaths. And the reason for that is I want these, this leather to soak in as much of that Obanoff's as possible, because while they're still wet from the Obanoff's, I'm going to wet form them to the ax heads. This is a sort of a trick. You could do water, soak the sheath in water, and then form it to the head, but then you gotta let it dry. And this works pretty good. You won't be able to get super defined lines using this method, but it will help you form the sheath to the head. And then once we get all the snaps and everything on the sheaths and everything, you can close it and hold it in place. I'll let the Obanoffs dry on the heads. And then once it's dry, the sheath fits the head like a glove. One side note, I'm trying to be super careful here. <laughs> because these axes are razor sharp. And if they were to slip out of that leather and down my hand, it would, it would be the end of my day. I would have to run to the emergency room and get some stitches. <laughs> but luckily that didn't happen and uh, I was safe. You also wanna put the Obanoffs on the inside of the sheath as well. Now we're gonna put some snaps in. So I only use line 24 snaps from buckleguy.com. That's it. I won't use any other snap anywhere. I punched the hole with a 5.30 seconds punch. And then I'm using a hand setter. I'll put a description or a link in the description to the snap setter. It's the best one I've found, but for doing snaps by hand. Here I'm just folding over the flap and I'm pressing down on the leather and that's marking 
where the other side of the snap needs to be. So once I get this other snap in, and I put that sheath on the head, it should fit perfectly. That white thing is just a scrap piece of cutting board. I cut the shape of an ax. Works really good. Overall, these sheaths fit pretty darn good. There is just a tiny bit of that bit sticking above that welt, but nothing to worry about. And uh, snaps down nice and tight. It's not coming off. Turned out really good. <clears throat> Once the Obanoff starts to dry, you can uh, start buffing it with a horseshoe brush and this will leave a really nice sheen finish on your leather work it, just, it will look incredible guys all right guys thanks for watching and 